Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Gina Wong. I'm a professor with the Graduate Center for Applied Psychology at Athabasca University. And I'm also the founder of the Asian Goal Driven Campaign. Hi, everyone. My name is Nancy. I am a second year um, Master of Counseling student at Athabasca University. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sharani Sivakumar and I'm also a second year Master's of Counseling student with Athabasca University. And we're here to talk about this framework and model that we've been developing. Um, it's called the Framework for Lionhearted Conversations in Academia. And, you know, really the impetus and purpose of the development of this framework was really born out of a need that we were seeing and, uh, you know, what was happening in the educational landscape seeing where conversations that happen very naturally in classes and also in meetings with administration and you know all types of conversations in the academic setting um, there is a lot of potential where mainstream colonial ways of thinking are you know are, are being i guess brought forward and it's difficult and hard sometimes painful to have these conversations in a way that can be productive and constructive so beginning to think about how we can do this in a way with intention. Just thinking about creating a lion-hearted um, model for having these conversations. It's, it's so easy because, and I guess one of the main assumptions in understanding and appreciating a model like this is to see that education is a place where colonial perspectives have been part of the erection and resurrection of university and the education and academia itself. So using this framework to serve as a guide for instructors, learners, administrators, generally people who are in education to think about how we can take part um, in lion-hearted conversations in a way that's helpful and not hurtful and what that actually means. What does it feel like to call someone in? And what does it feel like to be called in? So some examples, um, you know, when there is a continuum, I guess, of statements or opinions and things that can be shared in academia. And we want the academic setting to be a place where people freely share their ideas and opinions. So, so importantly, knowing that this is gonna happen and us, having a framework in which to address it is the better way to approach it rather than believing that we don't have racism, white supremacy doesn't exist in the educational landscape. Some of those ideas are actually more harmful because it doesn't allow for the possibility of these conversations and that all of us are gonna make mistakes, me, Shrani, Nancy included, we don't have it right all the time or even some of the time but the effort towards wanting it to be and having a framework to help us structure the ways in which it can be done successfully was our purpose in developing this model. So an example, um, someone in class may simply well-intentionally share the notion that, you know, Indigenous people are slower. I've heard this in courses. I've heard people say this with with an eye to understanding what this culture is about and not really understanding what that might sound like and feel like. So there's a moment where a lion-hearted lion conversation could take place and the stop, drop and roll model be used to call in. Um, another example is, well, one that I've been part of and maybe an example on this extreme, not that saying Indigenous people are slower isn't, um, a big concern because of course it is. But an example I have was, um, I was I was facilitating a workshop and at the start of the workshop before, when I was sort of you know getting my slides together, somebody had stated a racist comment um, towards me. And in that moment, to be able to stop, drop and roll, whether I be able to do that or someone else as part of the participants would have been, you know, a really ideal way to approach that or afterwards. Um, and so these are some examples of ways and Nancy and Sharani will share as well. And we'll continue to talk about 
And I know, you know, all of you probably have some example, whether as an observer or as a participant of the need for something like this, of this model. Um, and, and that it's not up to one person. So the idea that this is, we want to reinforce a collective community and a culture where somebody might stop and interrupt. So for example, to say, oh, I just heard somebody say, you know, and to say what the racist remark was, can we just stop for a minute? Like, I'm just wondering what just happened there. And then it could be someone else who, you know, goes forward with the rest of the model and saying, yeah, you know what, I heard that too. And, you know, so that conversation could take place or with that statement. And it's so easy for these moments to just glide by. It's easier, it's more comfortable and not saying anything uh, sometimes because we're, you know, fired up and not knowing what to say, we don't say anything. So in that example, with the Indigenous people are slower to say, you know, hmm, I just want to think about that. Let me pause for a moment and then someone else might pick it up and then someone else, else might pick it up. And then a discussion can happen, um, you know, and things can unfold rather than letting the moment go. And also knowing that sometimes the moment is gone and we did our best, but we can always go back. We can email people, we can discuss later on. We can say, you know, two weeks ago, you know, in that class, there was a comment. And I just want to go back and, and make note of that and reflect on that. So it's not like if we don't catch it in the moment that the moment is lost. So as an educator for over 20 years now, I am still learning. I am, you know, learning about this model, what ways I can enact it, and it is hard. So this is not going to be easy for anybody. And it takes up front, what I think is so important is to create and cultivate a space of cultural humility. And what I mean by that is to know that the space that we're going into does also agree with some of those assumptions that education inherently, there are beliefs and assumptions that are colonial based, Eurocentric, um, especially in psychology that the discipline itself has some very powerful colonial ideas and that education is a place that those powers, those ideas can be reified over and over and over again if we don't think about them and take pause and think about alternate ways of thinking. But in order to do that, it tips the apple cart. It makes everything, you know, what's going on is everything wrong. And, it, and, and so it's a, it's a courage, it's a lion-hearted way to start thinking about education in this way. And so cultural humility is to say, yes, this can be a space that's unsafe. Yes, the educational landscape can be a place that perpetuates racism. And we, in this place of cultural humility, want to actively do something about it. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Sharani to share some of her, her ideas. All right. Um, so I was actually uh, part of a training um, earlier this year where the facilitator um, butchered my name, along with also other people of colors, their names, um, and did this in a way where um, they were just kept repeating my mispronouncing my name. Um, where they kind of didn't let me take myself off um, mute to kind of interrupt. So I think in that moment, I could have uh, stopped and interrupted and um, and actually just interrupted the facilitator in a way of saying, hey, you know, this is how it's actually pronounced um, and hoped that the facilitator would uh, drop into that humil humility piece um, and bring awareness to themselves of how the way that they approached it wasn't in a like that cultural humility stance. It wasn't kind um, and kind of bring that perspective of how uh, I might have been feeling um, because when my name is like butchered in that sense, it's I'm left feeling like um, I'm disrespected, that it's not even worth trying to say my name correctly, um, and essentially a feeling of less than in comparison to other folks in that training. Oh, 
I just wanted to add, Sharani, that it would be really tough to do that in your position, you know, as a student and then in the moment feeling what you're feeling. So, you know, this model is also about other folks speaking out and saying something and, you know, maybe the full part of it, but just slowing it down and saying, you know, hold on, you know, like, um, did you realize that what you just said and, you know, done in a way that's respectful, but that does um, let the moment just go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there is a lot of space for me to like, also just get more comfortable to stop in that moment as well, but also balancing. Do I like, am I at a space where I feel tired of trying to correct people and interrupt that moment? Do I feel safe? Um, all those things come into play. Yes. Um, but yes, whether that be myself or someone kind of interrupt and kind of carry out this stop drill, drop roll would be beneficial for sure. Uh, and noticing in that individual's response as being called in that if they were rolling, so reflecting and responding, not reacting, and listening, you know, in the way with open heart or open mind and allowing themselves that, oh, okay, I made a mistake there, to be able to take ownership of that and, you know, to apologize or say thank you for sharing that with me. That would be, yeah, full scope of this model in, in its truest sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then just another example that I did want to share that happened from that training um, is the facilitator put uh, quotation marks around othering, um, which unfortunately really perpetuates this belief that othering is not a lived reality for BIPOC individuals. Um, and for myself, I know I felt like um, dismissed, you know, not seen or heard because unfortunately that is my reality in many instances of my life. Um, so I think this could have been an opportunity for other folks in the training to have interrupted um, the facilitator to, you know, say, hey, I just want to pause this conversation and think about um, what that kind of means to put quotation marks around othering and the impact of that. Um, and because I know in that moment, I was not in a space to stop that conversation, right. but also I was not, if I were to respond, it would be in a way of reacting as opposed to reflecting. Yes, yes. And, and possibly too, the open opportunities that if, if it's not safe in kind of that classroom space, then maybe it's an email to the instructor. Maybe it's mm -hmm. um, a few people sending it later or, you know, there's, there's ways rather than just the moment to capture that this model hopefully embodies. I was thinking about sometimes giving an example because if, if we were to read something where somebody put quotation marks around the word homosexual, I mean, right there, you can feel like, okay, what are you saying that homosexual is this concept that may or may not be? Um, I think sometimes people might be able to understand it better when it's put in a different light. Mm -hmm. um, because our lived reality is that othering is part of what we experience on an everyday basis. So thank you for that example. Mm -hmm. Nancy? And, and um, a quick example I can think of where um, all three steps, so stop, drop, and roll were involved. Um, was a discussion that I had with a cisgender white male colleague earlier this year. Um, it didn't occur long after the Atlanta shootings of the eight women, six of which were Asian women. So that collective trauma was still very fresh in, in, my, in my mind. And I think with the rise in anti-Asian racism and hate crimes in this pandemic, like for me, I was starting to feel really unsafe for myself and, you know, my friends and my family. So I had made this comment to him where I, I said, I felt like the world seemed to be a lot more unsafe nowadays. And he just said to me, no, it's not. What are you talking about? And in that moment, I remember I briefly, I stopped because I had to really kind of like 
I felt triggered by that comments. And so I had to really like paused in my head and kind of like reflected on why is this bothering me so much. And then going down to the to the drop of of the framework, I noticed that so I was thinking about awareness of you know how my thoughts, my feelings and you know my body senses and all that. And I noticed that the curiosity component of the drop was missing on his end. So rather than asking me why I felt less safe he questioned what I was feeling because that reality was not his it was different from his reality and so for for me I just explained to him well I am a petite Asian woman I am holding two visibly non-dominant identities and you know there have been a lot more hate incidents toward Asians recently so I fear for the safety of myself and my family so my colleague, um, he demonstrated the role pretty well in the sense that he didn't immediately react with defensiveness or shame. He just quietly listened. And when I was finished, he acknowledged that, yeah, I do hold a lot of ignorance because I am privileged in many ways. And I, I do sometimes forget that. So I thank you for educating me. So yeah that yeah very nice depiction of the model playing out in a way with a positive outcome thank you for that and you know we have a lot of examples that we could share and i think a lot of other people would as well and it's so important to be talking about these because we can learn from them and also feel not so alone when we're you know trying to be heard or calling in and then what it's like to feel on the other side to be the person that's being called in and to also understand that experience because I'm sure to be on that side of the coin as well. So thank you for joining me. This is the model so far. It's still in development and we hope that it invites other people, administrators, instructors, faculty, students to think about having and maybe declaring spaces that is you know cultural huma humility space and that we the idea that this model is one that we want to uphold in whatever space that that, that it is in is what what we hope um, can be attempted with this model so thank you both and uh, we'll have more to share later on 